temptation does not disappear this side of heaven. The ruts in our heart caused by sin are not normally erased by the Spirit of God this side of heaven. He helps us by His power not to slide into them. He gives us grace. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, and we're continuing a message we began last time. It's called an unflattering comparison. But Jonathan, you bring up a point that I think many of us can relate to. We may have these habits or patterns of sin in our life, and we really struggle to break that habit or to break that addiction, to break that sin cycle and struggle to do so. How does God give us that grace to say no to that sin? Well, the Lord in his kindness has given us his spirit to live within us. If we belong to Jesus, if we've trusted in Jesus, we have the help of his spirit day by day. And our only hope for change is the spirit's help in our heart. That's that's the Christian's hope and that's the Christian's help. But we know as well that this side of heaven, we take two steps forward and sometimes we take a step back. And we have times of victory and of real growth. And, and sadly, we do have times of failure as well. And those who have been walking with Christ any length of time will know about times of failure too. And the incident we're going to be looking at here in Genesis 20 reminds us that even the great heroes of faith, even one such as Abraham, had a, a, a path of walking with the Lord that was marked not only by success, but by failure too. And, and within that, we see the patience and the mercy of God at work, and that's a tremendous encouragement to us. Well, I think you will be encouraged as we open God's Word together today and look at Abraham. We're in Genesis chapter 20 as we continue the message, an unflattering comparison. Here is Jonathan. What the Lord does here in the heart and the life of Abimelech is quite remarkable, and it's not in the least what Abraham was expecting. When Abimelech takes Sarah into his house, we see in verse 3 that God comes to him in a dream and tells him he's in big trouble. And in Abimelech's response, we see something quite surprising within the heart of this king who knows nothing really of the Lord. Verse 4. Now, Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, to my mind, this is really quite something. Here is a pagan king. He is by no means a follower of the Lord, a member of the covenant family, none of that. But he acts decently. Whatever the dynamics of taking Sarah, whether that was a kidnapping, which would, of course, not represent any integrity at all, or some sort of a treaty marriage, Nonetheless, as the story progresses, the Lord declares that he's acted in the integrity of his heart. So there is some decency going on here. In, in many ways, he acts in a manner far better than Abraham acts. If there is one figure in the story who comes out pretty well here by the end, it seems to be Abimelech. And re remarkably, the Lord speaks to him in this very, very personal way. The Lord reveals that he has been at work in his life, restraining him from doing evil. Now, that is, if you like, an example of what theologians sometimes call common grace. Special grace or saving grace is God's work of grace by his spirit that is shown in the lives of those whom he saves in Christ. That's special grace, saving grace. But God also works by common grace to restrain evil in the world and to enable people, unbelievers, people in society generally, to do things that are kind and decent and beneficial in varying measure and degree. And here we see quite an amazing example of that. God has restrained evil in this man. He has been at work in his life by his sovereignty, and he has done so in a very remarkable way. Now, Abraham, for his part, he had very little concept of this and very little confidence in it. He tells us as much in verse 11. 
Abimelech quite reasonably asks Abraham why on earth he has behaved in this way. And Abraham's answer to him betrays so much. Verse 10. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you see that you did this thing? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. I'm going into a snake pit here, thinks Abraham. I'm going into a territory where the Gentiles rule, where there is no knowledge of God. Well, that may have been true enough, but in going into unbelieving territory, he was wrong to imagine that he was going into territory where God was not able to be at work in lives and God was not able to restrain evil. You see, the truth of God's sovereignty is that he is able to work in any life, in any culture, in any part of the world, because whether people acknowledge him or not, he is the sovereign creator, and he holds human hearts in his hand. And you know, frankly, there will be times when unbelievers around us will put us to shame by their good behavior. We've all seen that, I'm sure. There's a traffic jam, okay? You're late, and steam is starting to come out of your ears. You're, you're pushing through because you've got to get where you're going. But people in cars around you, they're being so gracious and so patient. They're waving others on ahead of themselves. There's, there's a contentious issue in the community, and some Christian friends post angry or discourteous notes on Facebook while unbelievers in the neighborhood are careful and kind in, in what they say. We've got some wonderful neighbors in our neighborhood, and I remember talking to one of our neighbors, and I, I, was, I was complaining about something. Really. I was saying something that was quite, quite difficult to deal with. I can't even remember what it was, something that needed fixing in the house. And, uh, and she said to me, but we've got so much to be thankful for, don't we? And I thought, the roles should have been reversed. That should have been me saying that. I'm, I'm chastened by your example in this. And we have those moments, don't we? We have those moments where we're put to shame, where the good behavior of outsiders actually points us to God's kindness. It shows us his common grace at work in their lives, restraining evil, making society livable, which, of course, it would not be without the intervention of the Spirit of God. The reputational damage here for Abraham is unavoidable. Abimelech notices and reprimands Abraham, verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? Why have you behaved so badly? Abraham. Abimelech, he frankly looks like the righteous one here by comparison. It's common grace, and Abraham, for one, didn't expect it. He didn't anticipate it. Now, why does it matter to us to understand and to believe that God can be at work in this way? Why do we need a theology, if you like, of common grace, an anticipation of common grace? Well, I think it tells us that we do not need to go into the world terrified of what unbelievers are going to do to us, quivering at the darkness all the time. I think we can fall into that trap just a little, especially as we do see our culture, let's be frank, darkening and becoming less receptive to the gospel. But we must not go into society imagining that the Lord will leave us to sink in the mire imagining that compromise and fearful self-protection is the only way forward. You see, that's what Abraham did in that moment. He assumed that people all around him would only do evil, that he would get hurt in the process, and that his only recourse was deception, and frankly, it was to throw his wife to the wolves. That's what he did. As society darkens, and it is darkening, there's no question about that. As culture moves further and further away from any kind of Christian values, and it is, I think we see it. The danger is we're going to throw our hands up in despair. We will declare there is no fear of God at all in this place. And we will adopt a fearful and a defensive posture, as Abraham did. But friends, let me tell you, that will not go well for us. We'll make bad decisions, pragmatic, 
faithless decisions if we assume that God is powerless to intervene and God's just going to throw us to the wolves. We need to know and believe and remember that our God is not powerless and he won't abandon his people. It's remarkable how the incident here with Abimelech ends. You know, Abraham began his time in the region thinking, I'm going to be killed for my wife if I'm not careful. I've got to deceive for my protection. That's what he does in verse 2. That's how he explains himself in verse 11. But little does he know how God is going to speak into Abimelech's heart and life. And look what God does for Abraham and Sarah through this unbeliever in the end. Notice with me how it all winds up. Verse 14, Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver It's a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, you are vindicated. This is an object lesson for Abraham and Sarah and for us too. An object lesson in common grace. His power to work in society for the sake of his people. His power to move the heart of the unbeliever to do good and not evil. Don't be surprised when God is at work in unbelievers. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called An Unflattering Comparison, as we take a look at three truths that naturally surprise us, but that we should learn to find unsurprising as we go forward in the Christian life. Well, I'm glad you've tuned in, and if you've missed any part of this broadcast or any part of the series, We're calling The Blessing. You can come to the website and you can listen to each and every program online. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. That is EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here is Jonathan. And finally, don't be surprised when God continues to use stumbling servants. I think we're very, very slow to appreciate and understand and wonder at the sheer patience and the sheer forbearance of God. You know, it really is a remarkable thing that God puts up with his people. It's remarkable that he puts up with me. It is remarkable, if I may say so, that he puts up with you. I hope you have a sense of wonder at his patience and forbearance. If we have any shred of honesty about ourselves, we'll have to admit that we are deeply flawed, continually sinful, repeatedly failing servants of God. If you don't know about that, that about yourself, you are either suffering a kind of self-delusion or you have something very, very profound to teach all the rest of us. This is just the reality for redeemed sinners who are works of sanctification in progress. Yes, the Spirit of God is changing us, praise God, but how slow and reluctant we are to grow. And some among us, many I suspect, will have a profound sense of this. You will stumble and sin, fail and fall, and you will wonder repeatedly, does God have any more time for me? Does he have any more use for me in his kingdom? And if you ever ponder that question, and I expect many do, the story of Abraham and this chapter of the story of Abraham has deep encouragement and deep comfort for you. If God should have given up on any servant of his, frankly, he should have given up on Abraham. We look at him here next to this pagan king, and the pagan, for the most part, looks like some kind of paradigm of virtue and righteousness, and Abraham looks, well, rather less impressive. Abimelech and his crew, while not believers, they understand the fear of God on some level. Abimelech hears the voice of God, and and notice how he responds, verse 8. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called his servants and told them all these things, and the men were all very much afraid. Abraham, for his part, he knows about fear in this chapter, but it's not primarily the fear of the Lord at the crucial moment. It's fear of a godless people, verse 11. Why did you do this, Abraham? Well, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place, and they're going to kill me. That's my fear. Well, what about your fear of God, Abraham? What about your trust in him? What about your call to obey him? And with his repeat offensive dishonesty of dishonoring his wife and his marriage, with this terrible witness to the pagan king for a second time around, we think, how can God put up with him any longer? 
It's not like he's a new convert fresh out of the gate here. We are a quarter of a century into this covenant relationship. And Abraham, he has been so privileged, so privileged. Surely the depths of the patience of God are now fully exhausted. But you know, all the way through this messy and this ugly incident, God remains absolutely steadfast in his resolve to protect and even to use Abraham. Notice what the Lord says to Abimelech, verse 7. This actually just jumps off the page. Abraham has been exposed in a deception. He is really covered in shame at this point. But notice what the Lord says of him. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet so that he will pray for you and you shall live. I mean, what? (laughs) Lord, haven't you fired Abraham at this point? Haven't you just quietly put him on desk duty at least, sidelined him and moved on, but declaring him now to be a prophet? What? (laughs) I believe this is the very first time in Scripture that anyone is declared to be a prophet of God. The prophetic office is a very big deal in Scripture. It's an office that points ultimately to Jesus, the supreme prophet who comes to earth to speak and to be God's final word. And Abraham has the honor of being the first person to receive that designation, to hold that office. And the announcement that Abraham is a prophet of God, it comes here. (laughs) And it comes now. This is a big moment. What's the Lord doing? Well, he's showing us that he does not give up very easily on his people. He's showing us that he used failed and fumbling, sinful and stumbling people to do his work. He is showing us the sheer depths of his mercy and his kindness. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of speaking with a parent about their son or daughter, maybe an adult son or daughter, who's, who's frankly, by your estimation, just a little bit of a mess. They've made some bad decisions. It seems pretty clear they're not on a great path. You have your own private concerns, maybe. But this parent is practically misty-eyed in talking about how their beloved son or daughter is, is getting on and how delighted they are in them and how pleased they are about the good things in their lives, their gifts and abilities, how much potential they see for the future. And you reserve comment, but you're thinking to yourself, are we talking about the same person here? <laughs> Ever had that experience? Is this parent not just a little bit deluded about their dear child? Well, maybe they are. Or maybe they're just parents who dream the best and pray the best and decide to see the best as parents often do. Now, the Lord is he's totally realistic about Abraham. Of course he is. There's no delusion here. But what we do see here is his fatherly heart. His wayward son is not about to be disinherited. He's not about to be thrown out of the family business because he stumbled yet again. And you know, the Lord does what he says he will do. Notice it in verse 17. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and also healed his female slaves so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. See, the Lord was still pleased to use the prayers of Abraham, to hear the prayers of his prophet, and to work powerfully in response to those prayers. It's wonderful how the Lord continues to use Abraham, and the fact that he does so, it it gives hope and encouragement to me personally, I'll tell you that. And I trust it gives hope and encouragement to you as well. You see, it says to us that our failures don't automatically render us useless to God. It says to us that God doesn't quickly reach some point of frustration, a point where he just gives up on us and moves on. And how we need to know that, don't we need to know it? We need to know it because, frankly, we might have given up on ourselves long ago, given the choice. And so if you are aware today of being flawed or failing, sinful or stumbling as a servant of God, and you wonder, is there any patience left for me in the heart of God? Any place left for me in the plan of God? If that's what you're asking, take comfort from the story of Abraham. God doesn't give up easily on his servants. He doesn't cast them aside. But there is a bigger picture here, and we need to see it before we close. The bigger picture in the story of Abraham is the fact that none of this depends in any way upon Abraham. That's the big thing going on here. At least it doesn't depend on him in an ultimate sense. His performance, his 
faithfulness, his obedience, those things are not the source or engine or driver of the plan of God for salvation here in Genesis. At the end of the day, Abraham is simply not the hero of the story. In fact, in this chapter, he is a kind of anti-hero. But that very fact, that very observation, it points us to the true hero of the story. You may remember that back in chapter 15, God spoke his covenant promises to Abraham. And we were told, chapter 15 and verse 6, that Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham trusted God, trusted the word of God, and God gave to him on the basis of his faith the gift of righteousness. And that gift of righteousness, of right standing before God, It ultimately comes to him through the true hero, the true prophet, the true savior who would come into the world centuries later. The one who would obey the father perfectly, who would trust him fully and then lay down his life willingly. At the cross, Jesus paid the price for Abraham's failure, all his failures, chapter 20 included. He paid there the price for for your failure and for my failure. And the failure of Abraham here, the fact that he is so obviously not the hero of chapter 20 or of the book of Genesis or of the history of Israel, the fact that he is so obviously not worthy, so obviously flawed and failing, sinful and stumbling, it points to the fact that his standing before God and his usefulness to God have actually nothing to do with himself at the end of the day. And it has everything to do with the one who would make him righteous through shedding his own blood. Genesis chapter 20 is actually, it's full of grace and it's full of gospel because it shows redemption in action. It shows God using and persevering with someone who's who's not worthy and doing so because of the Savior who would come. So as we close, I simply want to ask you, I want to ask you if you know this God, if you know his grace through Jesus Christ, his forgiveness through his blood, his patience on account of his cross, do you know him? If you don't, I want to say to you today that you can know him. You can receive his welcome and his forgiveness. You can be the beneficiary of his patience and the child of his care. You can come to him through faith and receive the gift of righteousness that Abraham received. And you can find a place of usefulness despite yourself in his kingdom. You can do that even today. For us who know him, for us who have received, let me ask you as well, are you today delighting in his grace, in his patience, in his forbearance shown to you in such ample measure and knowing these things, delighting in these things, are you giving yourself in trust to his service today with all your stumbling and all your sin, confident that he can use even you? Really a helpful look today at three truths that naturally surprise us but we should learn to find unsurprising as we go forward in the Christian life. Jonathan Griffiths today with a message called An Unflattering Comparison. And if you've missed any part of this program, you can always come to the website and you can listen online. Just stop by EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported ministry. It is your generosity that allows us to keep Jonathan's teaching on the station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you Jonathan's brand new book, It's called Strangers and Exiles. And in this book, he takes a look at Abraham, this foundational figure in the history of our church. And at the same time, Abraham was profoundly human. He messed up a lot. He was isolated in an unbelieving world. But his story shows what it means for the Lord to take hold of a sinner, privilege him with promises, and then use him in a service and sustain him to the end. We'd love to send you a copy of Jonathan's brand new book, Strangers and Exiles, which is all about pursuing faithfulness as pilgrims in a faithless world. You can find out more online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, K2E0A1 or in the U.S. at Encounter the Truth, 
215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.